My name is Barbara Sanchez. I'm head of the Center for Research Data Management at TU Wien. So that you know uh, where this today's event is embedded, um, this is a slide to put it in context. It is part of an event series called Research Data Management in Austria. This is an event that has been running for three years now within the project Fair Data Austria. We usually record all our events and uh, slides and video recordings are always available uh, in a repository a few days after it takes place. On the bottom of this slide, you can see the organizers. Today's event is hosted by TU Wien. This is a preview for our next event. It's called Research Data Management at Technical Universities. See how others do it. It takes place on the 24th of November and registration is already possible. Here are some housekeeping rules. So please uh, mute yourself during the events. Uh, if you have got any questions, um, don't hesitate to post them in the chat. We all try to answer them. Um, this event is recorded. Um, to keep the anonymity of our participants as much as possible, we only record the speakers and the presentations and we do not record the participants and we do not record the chats. So before we start, I would like to say some words about EOS because uh, many of the participants today and many of the speakers, of course, have been involved in EOS building processes in the last years. Some of us have all also been involved in EOS projects funded by the European Commission. So what we hear a lot is that EOS consists of federated systems and the challenge is to make all these systems connected. So this graphic now um, is a screenshot of a subgroup of, of EOS supporting projects. Four of them are regional projects and one is a thematic project, Expands. And together they are also referred to as the Infra EOS 5B projects. You might have heard about them. Today, we contacted uh, one of the projects, Mythos, and asked them to particularly um, share their experience um, with onboarding systems to the EOS ecosystem. You will hear in the course of the presentation that Ontologies play a big part also in the EOS ecosystem. So I would like to mention that Theo Wien is the coordinator of, a, of another European project called Onto Commons. And um, we have worked with NIFOS and NIFOS partners also in the course of this project. So this is the agenda for today. After the introduction of NIFOS and Onto Commons, and a short overview of EOS Support Office Austria, we will come to the actual topic of today, which is how can you actually onboard services onto EOS? And at the end, there will be enough room also for Q&A. So I will now hand over to our first speaker, Andreas. And um, Andreas, the floor is yours. And please yeah, thank you. introduce yourself. Thanks a lot. I will share my screen. Mm -hmm. um, okay, just a second. Um, so, can you see the screen? Can you see the screen? Works fine. Perfect. So, okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Andrea Sardinodoro from uh, the Cyprus Institute. I'm an associate research scientist there. Um, my uh, topic of research is um, computational physics. And I'm also the NIFOS Europe Work Package 6 leader. Work Package 6 is the work package of NIFOS, which fo is focusing on uh, user engagement and demonstrations and um, the uptake of FAIR and, um, in, in the community. 
So um, I'm I'm glad that I, I'm here today. I mean, uh, at least um, uh, virtually with you and sharing some uh, um, of uh, some of the work that Nifos Europe has been doing for the last three years, which is focusing on onboarding of uh, of services. Uh, so let me. Uh, Start very quickly. So, what is NIFOS Europe? No, NIFOS Europe is, is uh, an infra EOS 5 project. It's a regional project which consists of, uh, of 15 member states and associate countries. So, these are the, the countries you see on the map. I mean, we are mostly, uh, <clears throat> um, I mean, the countries uh, are uh, from the Balkans, from the Southeast. Uh, Europe and the Eastern Mediterranean, as well as um, Georgia and Armenia are participating. So, and in total, we have 22 partners participating in this effort. So, MIFOS is, has been built upon two pillars, I would say. One pillar is the operators of service for research and technology, and the other uh, foundation is the open science communities and infrastructure. So, I would say that MIFOS Europe is uh, an amalgam of uh, of these two uh, sectors, and you can see all the institutions. I mean, participating with um, Nifos Europe. So the mission of Nifos Europe is is threefold. I would say. So first of all, um, we would like to uh, uh, support the development and inclusion of the national open science cloud initiatives in all the fifteen member states and associated countries. Uh, that participate in, in uh, NIFOS uh, in the overall scheme of your governance. This is something that um, uh, has been done, I mean, to a large extent. The other mission is to spread the EOSC and FAIR principles in the community and train it. Um, there's been a lot uh, of effort in this direction, but however, it's not um, the topic of this discussion. But if you need more uh, information about this, you can just uh, send me a message and I will provide information. And uh, finally, um, we provide technical and policy support in onboarding of the existing and future service providers into EOS. And as you can imagine, I mean, I'm gonna focus on this, um, on this aspect of, of, uh, of NIFOS. So what we actually do is that uh, we have a concrete plan for service integration and onboarding. And this involves a pre-production environment, uh, which validates the readiness and maturity level for EOS onboarding. Uh, we provide a service portfolio management system based on the EOS uh, provider and service profile. We provide integration with federation core services, service categorization, and this service categorization basically leads to the onboarding of generic services, thematic services, and repositories. I mean, uh, very briefly, generic services include the computational services, high performance computing, virtual machines, um, uh, storage, thematic services. I mean, as the title suggests, I mean, includes uh, services which are, fo are focusing on particular thematic topics uh, and repositories, which are data repositories. So uh, the NIFOS Europe pre production environment is consists of the federated for services, which include the service catalog management system, which is Agora, the authentication authorization interface, the help desk monitoring and accounting. Um, and we are enabling regional service providers to integrate their resources through regional support. I, although I emphasize the regional um, service providers through this uh, workshop, we also uh, share our uh, knowledge and our know-how uh, with you how to uh, how to onboard these services. So in total, we have 37 repositories, 31 thematic services, 22 generic, eight core services, and 58 providers onboarded in NIFOS Europe. I mean, onboarded mean registered. And uh, so we have 16 uh, repositories which have been fully onboarded on NIFOS, 15 thematic, uh, 16 generic, eight six core services, and 53 providers have been um, uh, onboarded on NIFOS and European Open Science Cloud. Now, the NIFOS Europe service catalog basically is EOS compatible, provides an EOS compatible onboarding procedure. 
It is fully compatible with the latest EOS profile specification. It provides technical integration with the center, central EOS catalog, and it also provides monitoring of the onboarding process. And you can access the catalog by clicking on this link here. So finally, what I would like to say is that um, we also include um, the user engagement training and demonstrators in order to make sure that all the services that have been onboarded on, um, on, on EOSC are functional and uh, they, are, uh, uh, they are, ha are harmonized with, um, with the EOSC principles and they are of uh, high level uh, uh, TRL, I mean TRL 8 or 9. So once we onboard, the, we onboard a, a service, we provide training material on this service. We then we define definition of use cases in these different fields of research, structural heritage, life sciences, climate science, computational physics, I mean, in which most of the thematic services belong. And then these use cases are run by the actual scientific communities so that they test the services. And afterwards, we have an open call. We open a, an open call as a, as a proof of concept so that, I mean, uh, European researchers could use these services. And this is the open call. I mean, the open call, I mean, you can see we have 20 applications and we have uh, provided 3.8 um, uh, million core hours, CPU core hours, 128 CPU hours, and 50 terabytes of storage in total. So, uh, would like to thank you for your attention and let's go to the next speaker um, who is um, uh, Dr. Uh, Sarkar. So please, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody. Um, so how much time I have? Um, it's five minutes. Okay, okay. So I will... Uh, share my screen. Uh, see. Um, so there is some problem. Okay. Okay. So. Um, I want to give a very quick overview of uh, Onto Commons H2020 project. I'm Akupal Sarkar. I'm a researcher at ENIT. I'm an active member of Onto Commons and leading Work Package 3, which is about domain ontologies. Um, so, to set the context, uh, we are uh, mainly in the business of ontology. So what we are saying is that how, I mean, I am trying to contextualize in the today's agenda. So uh, for the open science practice, we need to think about uh, how to valorize the data uh, which uh, can be produced or consumed throughout the research life cycle at various phases. And what to, uh, we are saying is that ontology can help in uh, all of these, in most of these steps, uh, because it can actually integrate the data with a common shared model. And uh, uh, however, there are different problems we, which uh, we have identified in our state of the art. I'll go through that. But a very quick overview of Onto Commons project is a consortium of 19 partners from 10 member states, 15 RTDs, uh, four companies, but it has been increased uh, because we have onboarded some new use cases. So altogether, we have 22 use cases. We are quite uh, matured at this time. I mean, we have already spent two years in the project, so one year to go. Uh, the goals are, of course, to have an in interoperability among the data, so by the means of ontology. So also we want to uh, harmonize the ontology development uh, and the crosswalk. But it is, in fact, a CSA project, so we, have, we are uh, bringing together many communities uh, and, of course, uh, uh, taking their input as stakeholders. Um, 
However, the most tangible outcome of this project will be what we call a onto commons ecosystem, OCES. Um, and uh, I have a, a later session to talk about it more, so I won't spend time on it. Just to remind you that uh, the strategic guide, I mean, uh, strategic research innovation guide, um, the first version provided by USC talks about uh, some of the issues regarding the ontology and metadata. For example, the adoption is very much community specific, so there is no crosswalk between them. They are not well maintained and uh, sometimes they are siloed uh, with no communication or like a well-coordinated development. Also, there is no tools and common methodology. And I believe it kind of uh, uh, reflect the 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 goal of the onto commons. What it try it is trying to solve just to standardize and operational um, uh, intra cross domain data documentation, um, and also respect the fair data principle. Um, and 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 of course to allow uh, this will allow practical uh, reusability of data across domain uh, but uh, we are using ontology to do that but however we want to also maintain the ontologies throughout this process uh, we want to make sure the ontology is sustained um, and this will enable a new uh, uptake of new project results which will kind of help in the open science but we also have this interoperable software solutions, which we are kind of compiling from the existing solution to have a, like a tool chain to, uh, to help community to have a use of that. So this is the onto commons ecosystem, but I will talk about it more in the later section. Uh, so the current state of the art of many ontologies is already available. You can take a look. Um, I'm moving forward. Some important uh, point to note that uh, that uh, there are two topics. One is the fair ontology. So the ontologies themselves are not very much fair in the current landscape. So we are trying to integrate them and also make sure the other axis of fair is maintained. But then we have to remember that ontology can help in the fairness, which will be much more interesting to the EOSC uh, uh, community. So uh, we, we need to promote using more ontologies and not only ontology, but integrated ontology. But then, I mean, in the later uh, talk, uh, I will talk how you can use uh, integrated and harmonized ontology for, uh, for your data. Um, so the USC priority, uh, what uh, the SRIA talks about is that to create a governance structure for coordinating the work, um, on the metadata and ontology, um, and then um, uh, also embrace uh, existing registries for ontology and metadata. Um, and then of course, uh, have a clear protocol on that and then communicate about ontology and then kind of encourage the research community to use to share their, their data. Um, there, there are some some mention about finding a minimum metadata, but also uh, develop services that build on metadata registries. I think it is very much uh, aligned to what the Onto Commons roadmap is trying to say. Um, here is the snapshot of it. It is still not published, so I am not giving a link here, but you can see some of these are very much well aligned with the SRIA. Um, but in short, what Onto Commons can uh, do is the Onto Commons can support EOSC governance structure, as I mentioned in the first priority, uh, to provide, um, I mean, by providing insight and recommendation on the ontology and metadata, and also various principles of data discovery and exchange, uh, how this can be empowered by ontology. And of course, as we are developing, uh, we are developing new ontology and harmonizing existing ontology. It, this can actually help directly, and the road mapping can help in the next version of the C, as we believe. So this is all I believe uh, as a quick one. This is a snapshot of the Onto Commons project, and then if you have any question, uh, 
please let me know. Yeah. So yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Marco Paul. Thank so, you. So uh, I guess we should move to the next uh, speaker, uh, who is Bern Sarger from TUVN. I hope that I pronounce correctly your name, Bern. Um, so please, uh, the floor is yours. I mean, uh, maybe. So I mean, uh, introduce yourself. Can you see the slides? Yeah. Perfect. Um, so um, welcome to my presentation on the ESC support office Austria. My name is Bernd Zauruka. I'm a project employee at the Technical University of Vienna, and I'm mostly uh, involved in uh, projects uh, related to ESC and open science. Um, the ESC support office Austria is the Austrian ESC mandated organization. This initiative aims to implement the EOSC at Austrian level throughout um, annual uh, work plans. Um, besides that, other objectives are the development of an EOSC strategic agenda Austria, the establishment of working groups, the monitoring of, of the Austrian research landscape, as well as the initiation of KPIs. Achieving this objective is based on the listed guiding principles. The EOSC support office Austria is continuously growing. It, co it consists of ordinary partners and extraordinary partners. These partners are involved in many EOSC related projects. EOSC Pillar, one of the 5P projects where Austria is included, EOSC Focus, Skills for EOSC, only to name a few of them. If you're interested in more information on the EOSC landscape in Austria, please have a look at our latest Austrian country profile in Zenodo. The EASC support of uh, the EASC, um, support of Austria consists of its, its governance and several working groups. In the governance, the General Assembly is the ultimate decision-making body. The management ensures the optimization of processes and is subdivided in a rotating management board and a consistent EASC support of Austria secretariat. The EASC so, so, um, support of Austria further consists of the steering committee, which gives impulses for its basic orientation, and the synergy team that coordinates the work of the working groups. The EOS Cafe is an open forum that serves for the exchange of information and the coordination of the EOS and related open science activities in Austria. The EOS support of Austria also has several working groups, namely on the Austrian country profile, collections, data stewardship, KPIs, researcher engagement, stakeholder engagement, technical infrastructures, and training. In order to facilitate uh, smooth cooperation, as well as the exchange of information of ideas in the growing community, we established a website, a co-op working space, which is based on Confluence, a Zenodo community, and in total, 17 mailing lists. As I said earlier, the EASC support of his Austria Secretariat is the consistent part of its management. Its tasks are the coordination of back office functions, the coordination and monitoring of appointments, the organization of meetings and events, keeping minutes and protocols, the, do the documentation of activities, establishing and maintaining contacts, supporting the EASC Austria Zenodo community and establishing workflows. Within the EASC support office secretariat, there is a communication team taking care of the website development, the support and marketing, uh, the support of the marketing of P PR measures, the development of a communication strategy, as well as the dissemination of news. Here you can see three upcoming activities of the EASC secretariat. Um, we are planning to train our community in using the EOSC Support Office Austria working space. We are supporting the second General Assembly and we are preparing the first EOSC Support Office Austria newsletter. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to the EOSC Support Office Austria Secretariat team. Thank you. So thanks. Uh... Thanks a lot for this nice presentation.
Um, I guess now we should move to the actual uh, presentation of the of the onboarding of services. So I'll give the floor to um, Dusan uh, Vodrakovic, uh, my colleague from Nifos Europe, who is actually the World Package Leader, uh, the World Package 5 Leader of Nifos Europe. So Dusan, um, please, I mean, uh, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Andreas. So yeah, my name is uh, Dusan. Uh, Vudragovic. I'm from the Institute of Physics Belgrade, so I'm physicist here, but uh, within the NIFUS Euro project, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, actually responsible for the practical service onboarding, so uh, moving services from our region to, 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 uh, to be offered to pan European research communities via EOSC marketplace. So, therefore, in this first uh, presentation, the short one, I will try to give an overview of the NIFUS Europe service catalog and also try to explain how it is uh, linked to the central EOS catalog, also known as the EOS marketplace. So, it will be just a brief overview while details we will try to explain later in the following session. So, <clears throat> let's start. So, as far as I can uh, see, the resources, both uh, resource providers and resources itself, could be onboarded to the EOSC through uh, uh, two different ways. So the first one is by individual request or by integrating uh, with external catalog. So this first approach, individual request, is useful, I guess, for individual providers. So the total number of provided uh, resources per, per resource provider is relatively small. So typically, uh, this uh, happens when a single pro provider aims to onboard uh, self-hosted resources or similar. So in such case, all main onboarding uh, steps, such as, uh, as we will see later, information gathering, integration, validation, and publication of the resources are performed uh, with direct support of the central EOS onboarding team. However, for example, in our region, uh, we have a large number of research, resources uh, that are already onboarded and stored within the uh, national, regional or pro, uh, pro project uh, catalog. And in such a case, uh, uh, the first approach uh, uh, might have a huge overhead since all, on, all major onboarding uh, steps uh, are already performed by regional with, with the support of regional uh, regional operational teams and therefore uh, EOS provided a set of dedicated API uh, to support publication of already onboarded resources uh, into the into the central uh, into the central uh, marketplace. So as I said within the NIFOS Europe uh, we are focused on the second approach we are using uh, the second approach so uh, therefore we develop the project's uh, catalog so all service providers uh, from the region interact mainly with this catalog and it is uh, illustrated here at, uh, at this uh, slide. So all information are stored uh, within this catalog and then in the background uh, using the, 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 the EOS Marketplace API, we publish, uh, we, we, we synchronize information from the regional catalog with the central one just to ensure uh, consistency of the register services in, in both uh, catalog. Here is also linked to the, uh, to, to the, uh, to the portal. And since the catalog, uh, uh, it is based on Agora technology, and since it is fully integrated with uh, our authentication authorization infrastructure, also known as uh, NIFOS Europe uh, login services, uh, you can use your institutional institutional credentials, or also you can use uh, social credential to log in directly into the system. And once you are logged in, you will be uh, so. You, you will have observer credentials, so you will be able to read all information uh, about registered providers and resources. And we think that this is important because in this way you are able to see uh, how the resources are described within the catalog. So practically you will, you will be able to learn uh, by example. Yeah. So 
as I said, you will see all description, description of all entities uh, uh, within the catalog, and then you can uh, uh, this uh, the, this can help you in preparation of of your own service uh, description. But in order to register new resources or to to change the information that are stored uh, in the catalog, so Agora uh, administrator, which has a super user role has to upgrade your role within the catalog to provider admin and in that case you will be able to uh, edit provider information to register a uh, new provide uh, new new provider and similarly in order to uh, in order to uh, edit and 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 to register new resources uh, we have to upgrade your credentials uh, to to resource admin credentials also here, I would like to mention that our catalog is fully integrated uh, with the EOSC marketplace. So once the information are stored uh, within the regional catalog, uh, we, within the catalog, we have uh, created a dedicated role. So it is portfolio admin role. So users with the portfolio admin role, they are able to publish information from the regional catalog uh, to, the, uh, to the central uh, EOSC, EOSC portal. So, uh, how it is organized within the region. So practically uh, within the region, we have uh, one uh, portfolio admin per country. So in this way, uh, we, we try to create, to establish the fully decentralized uh, procedure on how resources are, are moved from the, from the region to the central uh, marketplace. So actually here you can see three places where the information are stored so there are not only uh, two of them uh, so the central tool is the agora catalog so it is illustrated uh, here in the in, in the middle of this uh, uh, slide and on the uh, left hand side you can see the EOSC marketplace so via api all information from the regional catalog are exported to the marketplace and finally, uh, you here on this slide, you can also see onboarding dashboard. It is on the right hand side. So the dashboard actually combines information that are stored uh, within the Agora and uh, uh, com within the Agora and the local uh, database. So in this way, we are able to uh, to 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 give a project specific view of the registered information within the catalog for example we have this categorization of the services into of the resources into repositories thematic services and generic services so somehow this is project specific uh, project specific categorization of the services within the EOSC market pet, uh, marketplace we have uh, fine grinded uh, categorization of, of the same resources and course now you can ask why uh, do we have three different places to store uh, information so there are many reasons but the main reason is because we are focused uh, within the project we have different uh, stakeholders so Agora is primarily oriented to resource providers the NIFOS Europe uh, 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 onboarding dashboard is oriented more to uh, regional scientific communities and EOSC marketplace is oriented to let's say pan-european uh, researchers yeah and uh, also here is just the snapshot from from the our catalog but Anastas already said uh, provide you with the number of the registered uh, resources so as I said we have big services so uh, research uh, specific services that provide value directly to researchers also we have common services or generic services they provide some uh, they provide the generic capabilities um, that can be addressed by uh, various uh, research areas so typically here we have hyper high throughput computing uh, services high performance computing services platform as a services um, generic um, generic storage services services for data preservation uh, also cloud infrastructure at, uh, at etc so once once again at the moment we have uh, 37 registered uh, repositories 31 registered thematic services 22 registered generic services uh, also uh, 
these services are provided by 58 uh, research providers that are also described and registered within the catalog here with the green color we, we marked uh, the portion uh, of resources that are fully onboarded with the yellow color portion of the resources that are partially onboarded it means that some action has to be uh, performed some integration has to be uh, performed by by uh, re research provider in order to be fully onboarded and uh, with the blue color uh, here is uh, given a portion of resources that are just registered within the catalog so what is green here it is also available in the EOS marketplace so once the resource is fully onboarded uh, within the Nivos Europe regional catalog uh, so one it is green it is exposed uh, via EOS marketplace as well so at the moment we have 16 uh, repositories 15 thematic services and 16 generic services exposed via via EOSC marketplace so thank you for your attention thanks Dusan so yeah let's go to the next speaker who is uh, Kostas Angelidis from Fairnet who's going to talk about service management in uh, EOS. so Kostas please thank you Kostas. good morning everyone I will try to share my screen Okay, can you see the presentation? Okay. Yes. Thank you. So, um, hello everyone. My name is Konstantinos Hagelidis. I'm a software engineer in, at uh, GRNet. Uh, this presentation is about maintaining a service portfolio using specifically the Agora tool, which is a nice segue from the presentation, the nice presentation that Dusan made. We are going to talk about the technology behind the catalog that uh, we are developed here at GRNet, which also adheres to FITASM principles, which is a standard that we are going to discuss briefly about. Um, all in all, we are going to see uh, how the Agora as a tool uh, operates, and with that opportunity, because it adheres to FITASM, which is a standard of how to do service management. We are going to see the thought process behind it and some of the principles that we are used designing the tool, which is uh, directly tied to how uh, service management is expressed in uh, FITSM, which is a standard, and specifically about the concept of service portfolio, that, which is what, it's what the Agora tool implements uh, in detail. So, uh, a brief introduction to service uh, management. Uh, service management is all about uh, how do you manage as a service provider the delivery of services to your customers. It includes, of course, technology, people, processes and activities, and uh, all the steps of the life cycle, how, on designing, uh, first designing the, a service, how do you implement the service, how do you deliver it to the customers, and how you plan on going support for the service. Of course, there are many standards over the years about uh, how do you manage, uh, how do you do service management. Most of you will know um, a gold standard in uh, this sec sector, ITL, which is used by very large organizations for quite a lot of years. And uh, but uh, there are some new contenders in this space, and uh, this is FITSM, which is a new standard, a new way of doing uh, IT service management. It's supposed to be and strives to be uh, lightweight, so it can easily be adapted by smaller organizations, and it's optimized to be used in cases like ours, that is, in federated environments. <coughs> it's all about managing interoperability between different service providers that they might be competing or cooperating to provide uh, services to a large number of uh, users, in, that, in this case, uh, the uh, European researchers. Now, FITSM is all about uh, establishing the required processes in your organization to be able to efficiently uh, manage service delivery. I'm, I, I've, there are many documents and uh, terms and principles. Right here in this slide, I try to gather around the most important processes. And uh, it's easy to divide them into two categories. Uh, the row below is uh, processes related more, more to the operational staff of your organization. And we see here that you FITSM says, uh, says as a standard that, that you need to have, of course, 
um, a way to manage uh, to manage problems, a way to manage inc incidents and requests, which is two actually different topics. Problem management is all about uh, having the having done the preparatory work to avoid problems, and incidents incident management is uh, where you establish what to do when uh, uh, incidents uh, arise, which is in in inevitable in some cases. Uh, it includes configuration manage management for your services, VMs, containers, uh, uh, files, and stuff like that. A way to manage uh, changes, of course, and uh, be uh, have uh, visibility over them. Uh, a way to have a pipeline of deploying stuff to your infrastructures as a services. So uh, that means that you may have had that as a continuous delivery. That means that your developers are able to push code to, uh, to your repositories and there automatically the code is tested, checked out, uh, compiled and uh, deployed automatically to your infrastructure. Of course, there is included a process established for continuous service improvement, which also includes, a, let's say, a mentality in your organization and effort put and time to be able to observe both your services and your service management processes, evaluate them and have the ability to make decisions to improve them continuously to provide better services to your customers. On top, there are, there are more uh, um, tactical uh, processes, uh, like uh, having a service portfolio, which is a, a very essential thing uh, for you as a service provider, which is actually a list of all your services that you offer to the, your customers um, described in detail for internal use in your organization and for external use to your customers. You also have to, uh, have, you, you have to establish a, a way to manage service level agreements, SLAs, OLAs between you and your customers and your partners, suppliers and stuff like that. You also need to have um, consistent processes on what do you evaluate what reports do you produce regarding all those management processes and uh, how those reports, when are they produced and if they are produced in time, so as to be used in evaluations and decision making. Of course, here is also the processes uh, that you need to have to check the availability and continuity of your services, uh, capacity planning for your infrastructures, all the important stuff about the information security and of course, managing the customer and supplier relationships. The most strategic ones for you as a service provider is the top two. And on this presentation, we will focus on the service portfolio, what it is, how do we maintain it, and how do we design the tool that is Agora that helps you maintain a service portfolio. So what is a service portfolio? Actually, in simple terms, it's an internal tool list used by the service provider where uh, think about it as a registry where you register information about all your services, both the ones that are live in production and are offered in customers, as well as the services that are in preparation during development and implementation that are soon to be uh, offered, and also all services that might be discontinued uh, or uh, uh, closed and stuff like that. This is for internal use. It's a large, uh, let's say, registry that you put information there describing technical details about your services, marketing details about your services, organizational information and legal information and stuff like that. And it is, of course, the basis to build the service catalog. So from the portfolio that you maintain, you can build the service catalog, which contains is another list that contains a subset of the information available of, of the, the portfolio and only the services that are live in production so as to be presented in the public eye as a menu of services to your customers so as they know what do you offer and uh, what they can um, uh, order from you. Now, going to Agora, which is the technology and the specific tool implementing the management of the sales portfolio we developed in, in, at uh, GRNet it is a tool that uh, provides an easy and modern uh, management UI for users to have certain roles and be able to add information that organize information about the services of uh, their organization that are offered to customers. It also provides uh, 
API for programmatic access to those uh, to, to this information and uh, an easy way to publish info that, uh, that information to external catalogs, as we will see momentarily. This is, as Dusan also presented, the main interface of an Agora instance. Uh, we see here the, the management uh, interface. Users have different roles, roles in order to manage a list of services of the organization. Uh, here we see such a list and we also see the, the gist that is the main information of each service, which is in quite detail. And what about what information do we need to provide to describe our service? Well, there is a specification that uh, Agora is uh, built to adhere to. This is the EOS Profiles version um, 4.0 specification, which actually uh, has uh, data models that uh, conceptually describe um, items in the EOS context, such as what, how a provider is described, how a service slash resource, sometimes those terms are used interchangeably, and stuff like that. Uh, here, I have gathered in this slide the whole sections of information, parts of information uh, that are, um, according to the profile, that are used to describe a whole service. Some of them are mandatory, some of them are optional, and Agora is based completely to adhere to, to those uh, data models and the, the, the UI itself helps, you, helps to the user to fill in the correct information. So uh, we can see that we have for a service a basic information on top, which is the name of the service, of course, the ID, a, 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 a bit of info about the providers of the service and the main website gateway to, to visit to get information about the service. You have the marketing section, which has a much more rich description about the service, taglines, multimedia links, and uh, use cases. We have a dedicated section, of course, to the classification of the service. And in our case, and the, using the EOS profiles, we have specific fields for the scientific domains or subdomains, categories, target users, and also freeform tags that can be used to categorize and organize the service information. There is a dedicated section on management, which there, there you can put links to your terms and policies documents, your help, help desk page, your monitoring page, your training materials, and uh, your documentation materials. There are also um, sections about geographical and language availability, the location of the service, contact information about the people that maintain the service. An interesting also section is the maturity of the service, where you there you put up information about the version, the change logs, the TRL of the service, the certifications and the standards. You can also have a dedicated section to express dependencies uh, of your service, how the service is um, related to other services in um, the um, uh, federation, what are the required resources or services that need to be established in order for the service to work and stuff like that. And also some sections about attribution, the funding bodies, how the services accessed, accessed or ordered, subscription models, payment models, pricing, and stuff like that. And as we will see on the... No, I'm sorry, I mean, maybe you just uh, conclude, I mean, because... We yeah, are... uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, as we will see uh, on the next slide, uh, those uh, models are, are uh, um, completely directly mapped to the forms and the UI elements of Agora tool that help you fill in each section and also come back to add more information and have visibility about the, the, each field, what does it express and how it's linked, of course, directly to the profile itself. Also, after that, if you maintain that information in Agora, you can quickly push it and publish it with one button to the to external catalog, such as the NIFOS catalog that Dusan previously showed in detail, and also the EOSC marketplace. So in order to conclude, I hope you took a brief introduction about the importance of service management and specifically for the maintaining a service portfolio. Any questions? Back to you. So oh, thanks a lot, Costas. Um, okay, the questions will be asked at, at the end of the of the I mean uh, webinar. There's a Q and A. Okay. Um, so the next speaker is Mariana Katrakazi. Katrakazi. 
yes, sorry, Katrakazi. Katrakazi, okay. So, and she will be talking about the, the Rolex tool, which has been developed within the, the framework of NIFOS. So please, Mariana, um, the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you very much. Um, a few words about me. I am a lawyer. I'm a legal associate at Athena Research Center, and I participate as legal expert in the team for the implementation of NIFOS Europe. I'm also a member of the Task Force Rules of Participation Compliance Monitoring. And I will talk to you today about Rolex Tool, a tool developed in the by Athena Research Center team in the NIFOS Europe context. Can you see my slide, my presentation? Yes. I think yes, okay, perfect. So <clears throat> a few words about uh, what is what are the rules of participation, the OSC rules of participation. Um, Maybe, Mariana, you are not in presentation mode. What? Ah, no, but... Uh, uh, in my in my screen, it seems like I'm in presentation. Uh, you, saw, you you need to switch. I mean, there is um, you you have like um, an additional screen, right? Sorry. Can you, can, you can just duplicate, mm -hmm. or you can switch the. Um, um, Wait one second. Yeah. Okay, now you see my slide, but it's not in uh, presentation mode. Yeah, click on presentation mode. Now? No, but look, I mean, do you have, do you share, do you have a, like an external screen? Do you use an external screen? No. No. Okay, I well. I, I see it in presentation mode. I don't know um, why you cannot see it like that. Okay, but in any case, you see the slides, right? Yeah, yeah. Maybe we should not uh, waste uh, the time and uh, the go ahead. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. So, uh, a few words about rules of participation. Um, it's about all those standards and conduct required for uh, EOSC participants. Uh, all EOSC resource providers before the onboarding process, they have to adhere to those rules. Uh, the current version of those rules is a high level in order to be long-lived. But what is the challenge of this situation? The current version of rules of participation does not provide for specific compliance criteria. There is lack of sufficient knowledge and uh, prospective resource providers, they are not aware of the specific legal and ethics conditions that apply to the rules of participation. So to address this challenge, we created Rolex tool, Rules of Participation, Legal and Ethics Compliance. What is Rolex? Uh, as I mentioned before, it was developed in the NIFOS Europe context. It's a self-assessment tool against rules of participation that focuses on legal and ethics aspects. It raises awareness about compliance criteria. It helps users understand what are the main priorities of rules of participation. They can verify by themselves if the resources align with the legal and ethics standards of your schools of participation. It helps them to identify any omissions and proceed to the necessary corrective actions. And as a result, it helps them to save time and make an efficient onboarding process. It is addressed to all resource providers that are familiar with legal and ethics conditions that relate to the rules of participation. So how it was developed this tool, uh, we based on the current version of your rules of participation. We broke, that, we broke down those rules into general categories, and then we have reconstructed them into units of rules classified according to the priorities of rules of participation. As a result of this process, we created a structured flow of questions that uh, are categorized into th three levels of importance. Next to each question, there is a, a color, which stands for, red color stands for questions of high importance, yellow color for, for questions of medium importance, and green color for low importance questions. Ariana, uh, 
Uh, I'm yes. sorry, but you, you're not changing slides. I don't know. You, uh, something. Uh, now you do not see development approach. No, no. Maybe try the symbol on the top of your screen. Symbol. A symbol of a. Uh, which second, one? I don't know. Right side, on the top of your screen. Mariana, the one that says Provoli. Uh, I, I chose this one. I do not know why. Uh, I do not, sorry, I do not maybe, know why. I don't know. Um, maybe but, first uh, uh, start the uh, Provoli and then uh, share the screen and select the screen with uh, the full screen. Now it's changing, so yeah, maybe we should continue like that. Exactly. But it changed now and it works as well. Yeah. The problem is once I'm in presentation, I cannot <laughs> return back in Zoom in this Zoom meeting. So I have to uh, go out first. Now? Yes, we can see yes. a different slide. But you see how it works. Just, okay, just click now? on the slide, I would say. Just click on the slide on the. Okay, so you, now you see development approach? No, you go one slide back. I mean, just click on four. Okay, so what do you see? How it works? How it works, yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, the first at uh, the first step, uh, when uh, when you visit the tool, Rolect tool, um, users have to insert some general information about the resource. What is the type of the resource? Is it service or other? Where is the URL where it's found? And other critical information that reflects the core principles of rules of participation. Then the user has to insert all this information that relates to intellectual property rights that may uh, be included in the resource and the licensing conditions that apply. Uh, then the user has to indicate uh, any further uh, restrictions that may apply in the resource, such as um, cultural information, which means uh, information that falls into the scope of cultural heritage law, personal data information, and other ethics conditions. And finally, the user can download in PDF format the the assessment in uh, the, the report assessment. This tool can be explored either as guest user or as authenticated user. And it's very important to notice that this tool has a dynamic content and the questions that appear depend on the answers given previously. So uh, now I don't think that you see the next slide. You see how it works? Okay, uh, I do not know how, how to do this, um, but I'll try. Maybe I suggest something. Uh, can you quickly send the slides? No, I, I will share the screen. Okay. This was the problem. Now you see a, a print screen from uh, how it looks like the tool, right? General information, resource URL. Yeah, now we are on the Rolex. Actually, okay. uh, great. So this is how it looks. Uh, you see the first section uh, relates to some general information about the tool. You see uh, those questions are marked with red color because uh, they are questions of high importance. And you see uh, service transparency provisions where in case where our resource is a service and then IPR basic information restrictions licensing out when uh, we have an open license that applies um, and and uh, etc so uh, some few words about the legal aspects in order to explain to you how it works the tool mm, about intellectual property rights there are some questions that aim to verify that no ip rights of third parties are infringed uh, 
when we have um, a, a resource that qualify uh, that is protected under intellectual property law, we have to check what are the licensing conditions that apply. If we have an open license, we have to indicate it because it's very important in order to permit the free flow of such resource uh, in the EOSC ecosystem. When we have uh, in the same resource two or more licenses that apply, we have to run a, co a license compatibility assessment, which means that we have to check that the two licenses, they are compatible with each other. Uh, in this regard, you can check another tool created by our team, LCT tool, um, which aims to face these challenges, these challenges related to license compatibility assessment. Um, and also, as I mentioned before, the, the tool has some uh, questions that aim to verify a minimum level of compliance with GDPR in case we have personal data in our resource um, that relate to the lawfulness of the processing. If the resource provider has to be able to identify the legal basis for processing data, uh, information obligation, and uh, verify if the rights of data subjects are satisfied. Uh, further aspects that are um, mentioned in the tool, ethics restrictions. The resource provider has to verify if there is any code of conduct uh, that applies or if the resource adheres to commonly agree agreed principles. And lastly, any other conditions that may allow, such as public sector information or restrict the use of the resource, for example, trade secrets or confidential information has to be indicated as well. So a, a very quick hands-on session, assume you have a data set and you wish to onboard it within the EOSC portfolio, but you're not sure if you meet the basic EOSC rules of participation requirements. What do you do? You visit our tool, you visit Rolect through this link, and then you fill in the compliance form and you verify if you can very identify what are the intellectual property rights included in the resource, and if you are able to answer positively the first section of questions, at least the, the, the one that I showed you previously in the print screen, uh, how it looks the tool, which called general information, where all questions were marked with red color. So in the positive case, um, you can continue, you are in the, on the good, uh, Row, let's say you can continue checking the rest of inclusion criteria. In the negative case, you have to review your resource, you have to review the data set and proceed to any corrective actions for complying with rules of participation before starting the onboarding process. Um, I highly recommend you to check this tool and give us your uh, feedback or any thoughts about uh, this tool. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. And I remain available for any further clarification. Thanks a lot, Mariana, um, for the nice presentation. So I think we should go to our next speaker, who is um, Arkopol Sarkar. Um, so Arkopol, please go ahead. Just to let you know, it seems that we are um, behind the schedule by like 15 minutes. Okay, I mean, Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, I can see. Um, I'll try to be quick. Uh, so, of course, that's, um, not, that's not what I was going to suggest, but it's fine. I mean, uh, uh, no, no, it's, uh, it's okay. I mean, uh, I think uh, I have to also adjust this presentation a little bit uh, for the for the audience. So, so here we are going to. Um, talk about the onto commons ecosystem if you remember from my earlier presentation uh, that this is the most tangible uh, outcome of onto commons project and uh, i am arko paul sarkar again as i introduced myself already i will move to the next slide if it goes okay so uh, so so this ecosystem is targeted to provide a complete solution for data documentation. So I think uh, this word data documentation will be kind of uh, very familiar to the USC community, 
who are trying to uh, 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 store, collect, organize the data and make them fair for the community, for the research community. But then what we are trying to solve from the earlier presentations, I mean, uh, that, that uh, these data are not integrated so yes, you can you can go to one of the repository, one of the service catalog, and then access the service. But then, the, it is very hard to uh, kind of curate the data from many sources and then use it for your uh, research. And for that, uh, this ecosystem is um, is built to address that problem. So at the heart of it, there is a stack of ontologies kind of uh, organized as per the generality of that. It's a little bit technical here, but then um, you can think it like the ontologies which are serving more close to the, um, uh, the data are called domain level ontologies. And there are many ontologies for different domains um, uh, um, but then these domain level ontologies are kind of integrated with some uh, some upper level ontology, which are at more generality, um, more abstract, and they goes like MLO, TLO, mid level ontology, top level ontology, like that. But then it is not this just stack of ontologies. There are several tools and methodologies which we are also uh, putting it in the ecosystem. In the end, we are expecting that this ecosystem will help you to have a harmonized vocabulary for your need uh, for uh, mainly annotating your data and services. But then uh, this alignment of methodology is also being proposed as a future guide for a continuous alignment process so that you, it is kind of sustainable. Uh, we are also developing a technical principle for mainly for software developers uh, who are uh, who wants to follow this ecosystem. And then also the ontologies we are providing, the metadata we are providing, we want to know that how good they are. So we are providing some set of evaluation criteria, fairness criteria, fairness score is one of them. Um, but then also some data documentation specific tools, say for example, searching a good metadata schema for your data, annotating your data, and then recommending such schema based on your data. I mean, I will say automatic recommendation. Um, and all of these, and also uh, how you can then maintain the data uh, uh, with their version provenance information in the knowledge base that is also included in the tool. Uh, then quickly uh, that that these ontologies uh, uh, need to be harmonized. Uh, there are many existing ontology, as I showed in the earlier uh, presentation, that from the state of the art, we have found almost like 160, 170 ontologies. That is also only in the materials and manufacturing. So industrial domains, you can say. So we are not taking into account the other domains, maybe in the future, but uh, uh, but they are, I mean, we found they are not fair. They Their fair score is very limited. Um, so the alignment needs to be done, but the alignment needs to be done in at many different levels. So of course, we have to use common language to express this um, metadata. We have to align the terminologies, that is the, uh, I mean, the set of terms which are referring to the concepts. Um, we have to do kind of semantic alignment, which is much more a logical way to align the schema, uh, um, but, the most important point is that this onto commons ecosystem is not actually imposing a certain metadata or certain ontology this is very important that we are adopting a, a pluralistic uh, approach that means to say that uh, at any level you can actually adopt many different uh, existing ontologies um, as per your need. And we are making sure that when you use many different ontologies, they are actually aligned. So they are, uh, so you don't have to worry about the interoperability or crosswalk among them. Well, I, I mean, I'm not going into this slide. This is kind of like the top reference ontology mapping, how it is being organized. It's a little bit too technical, I believe. 
uh, so uh, um, a quick introduction of how it is being um, mapped, this interoperability is uh, happening at the domain level, which will be much close to the data. So uh, you you will probably use one of the domain ontologies, but then here you can say that as these domain ontologies for a certain domain, there can be many different domain ontologies. They are interoperable themselves because they are following a single TLO in the hierarchy. Um, uh, so we are calling that a TLO branch. So it is achieving the 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 intra ontology interoperability like that. However, we are we are building this mapping between the different TLO. So if we can have some different domain following a different upper level ontologies, for example, say cultural heritage may have a different upper level ontology from the manufacturing, which is very different uh, uh, subject. Uh, but then as we have the mapping between this upper level ontology, this will also uh, give you an opportunity to do crosswalk between these very disparate domains. Um, about the methodology, we are following linked open term methodology. This is uh, a, a, a popular methodology also used by other uh, standardization. Um, so following that methodology, uh, uh, we, we you have different phases of how you can build a good schema. So there are requirement specification, implementation, publication, maintenance, quite like software development, but it is for the ontology. And we have mapped different uh, uh, different standard and toolkits for all of the phases. However, we are suggesting some of them as part of the ecosystem to be completely uh, uh, giving you a tool chain kind of uh, to achieve uh, your uh, your schema need. So for requirement engineering, we are suggesting you use competency question, use ORST document template, and then all of these are kind of detailed in our deliverable, uh, which is D3.4. If you look into it in the Zenodo or Onto Commons website, you may find it. Moving ahead for ontology editing, we are recommending two tools, which are uh, uh, kind of uh, hosted by some of our members. Um, so one is Sulosons, which is uh, developed by Total Energies, give you a graphical interface to document your data, annotate your data, also develop ontology, but it is mainly uh, uh, suitable for data documentation. And more uh, traditionally people use, who are ontology developer use Protege, and so there is a tool called Ocean, which is a derivative of the web protege. But we are trying to integrate this tool in the ecosystem platform. The platform, I mean, I will come a little bit later, uh, um, but here is another slide about the bridge concept. Let me skip that slide a little bit because it is, it is a little bit technical, but this is a way we are a kind of uh, providing this pluralistic approach where you can use multiple upper level ontology for your need. Now, the industry portal is, uh, is a hosted repository mainly, but then it's not only repository, it provides many other services, but you can see that there are some ontologies. We are constantly uh, uh, adding new ontology. However, most importantly, these ontologies are completely uh, uh, annotated with FAIR metadata. So you have all the information you need uh, for finding and accessing this, uh, these ontologies. You can have some, uh, you, there are already some alignment done between these ontologies, uh, which you can explore, but it also provides some recommendation services. Um, so, so yes, I mean, these are the features, I mean, uh, but uh, uh, this is also kind of uh, categorizing the, I mean, the metadata for, uh, for better discovery. Um, and also we have several other plan for this to, as I said earlier, to integrate this, uh, these editing tools and then uh, evaluation tools into this uh, platform. Um, 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 most importantly, I 
forgot to mention that it will also give you a fairness checking service called OFAIR. So if you provide an ontology there, it will give you a fair score. So yeah, so the last summary, I have, want to give you a workflow that how you can use this on the commons ecosystem. So if you want to document some data with your, uh, uh, I mean, with the semantic, either you can use uh, uh, an existing ontology or metadata for which you can go to industry portal and then you can use the services to find a good ontology, also compare alternative ontology according to their uh, um, uh, scores. But then if you want to develop a new ontology also, you can, uh, I mean, we are providing the methodology to how to how to gather requirement and then, and then how to reuse the ontologies for reusing. Again, you can go to the portal to find uh, some good ontology to start with. And then um, you can use the editor tool to edit the ontology to annotate your data. But then in the end, you can, you can again store back the data and the ontology in the portal and then maintain version and then maintain provenance of all of them. So for more information, uh, there is already uh, one, one uh, long session done in the FOMI uh, workshop just happened last month. So it is already uploaded in the YouTube. I think we will share the slide so you can take it from there. It is a little bit technical, but then I will also mention that it's something is coming up next month uh, at Stuttgart. Uh, just keep an eye on this URL. There will be more information on how you can join either remotely or physically, but then it will be much close to the user's point of view where we will explain the Onto Commons ecosystem. Okay, thank you. So thanks a lot, Marco Paul. So, um, so according to the, to the, to the schedule, if you have like a, a break of, of, of like five minutes, I mean, what do you think, Barbara? Uh, uh, shall we have this break and then come back in like uh, two, three minutes and... Yes, I would say five minutes break, yeah? Five minutes, okay. I mean, we are a little bit, I and mean... Again at half past? Easier yeah. to again, I'm sorry. 10 minutes, we meet again at 11.30. 11.30, yeah, that's fine, yeah. Yeah, yeah. good. Uh, can you hear me? So Andreas uh, had to leave us for 30 minutes, so I will take over. My name is Eric Barapulo. I work for Athena Research Center in Greece, and I'm involved in NIFOS Europe, of course. Uh, and in this session, we will continue by uh, getting into some presentations, by showing some presentations that get into more detail on the uh, specifics uh, that you need to know to onboard your services uh, to the NIFUS catalog, which is linked to the ES marketplace. So, uh, Dusan, uh, you may take the floor again and present the generic services and how uh, we onboard them. Thank you, Ellie. So, yeah, in this presentation, I will uh, present in general, generic services in general. So generic services available uh, in our catalog. But however, since this is the first presentation of the uh, of the onboarding process to the EOS catalog session, I'll, I will cover some, uh, I will cover onboarding process uh, e e itself, just to clarify how we see the onboarding within the NIFOS Europe. So I will present what is common for, for uh, from the onboarding uh, point of view uh, to all these kind of the resources, so generic services, systematic services and repositories, and then we will see what is specific. Okay, therefore, uh, let's start with the EOSC uh, uh, architecture and somehow I will try somehow to position onboarding of, of particular research in this uh, quite complex uh, diagram. So, although it is uh, complex, you can clearly see uh, four major components of the architecture. Two of them are horizontal. So, we have this EOSC exchange layer uh, and EOSC core layer, and two of them are vertical. So, we have EOSC interoperability framework and EOSC uh, support activities. <clears throat> 
So the goal of the onboarding process is to somehow incorporate resources outside of the EOSC into the uh, EOSC uh, Federation. And once it is done, the resource uh, will appear in the EOSC exchange layer. So all resources offered uh, by the EOSC to researchers somehow exist in the EOSC, EOSC exchange layer. And the onboarding process is the process that moves uh, resources outside uh, of the EOSC into the S exchange exchange player. However, first thing uh, when you have a bunch of resources, the very first thing you would like to do is to somehow describe them uh, in the in the in the same uh, way. So and therefore EOSC uh, developed um, uh, EOSC profile specification as it was presented in previous session by, by, by Costas. The latest version of the EOSC profile spe specification is the uh, version 4. And actually, EOSC profile specification is, since we are talking about ont ont ontology, so this is ontology and also, but also a database a schema of how resources um, should be uh, should be described within the catalog. And practically, this sales profile specification, this schema, is implemented as Agora, Agora catalog. So practically, Agora is implementation of, 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 of uh, this uh, schema. So this is the first thing. So we would like to describe resources in the same way. But then uh, the second thing is oh, with, when you have different heterogeneous resources, uh, then what you would like to do, you would like somehow to operate them uniformly as much as possible. And uh, when I say the operate, I mean, uh, we would like somehow to provide unique access to all of them. Then also we would like to, to create a metric for measurement of uh, service performance in terms of utilization, provided support, availability, reliability, etc. And for this, uh, you will need a set of operational tools and also uh, policies that are within the uh, EOS group in the EOS core layer. So here in this uh, layer, EOS core, you can find Typically, you can find help desk system. So in order to, to, to be able to measure uh, quality of, of provided support, uh, then you have authentication and authorization infrastructure just to be able to measure usage of, uh, uh, to, to be able to, to see how many different users you have in the system. Then uh, we have monitoring system just to, to monitor availability and reliability of provided resources, then accounting system to, uh, to measure usage of particular uh, of particular service. And also here we have a set of rules that define uh, they define minimal condition and regulation uh, for 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 inclusion of resources into the EOSC feder uh, federation. And as a result, okay, when as a result, when once we have this chaos uh, call layer, uh, we would like to establish some kind of uh, interoperability between EOSC exchange and EOSC core layer. So practically, this is uh, done by integration of the external tool with the uh, with the tools from the EOSC uh, uh, EOSC core layer. Okay, but uh, the aim of the EOSC is not only uh, to achieve interoperability uh, from the operational perspective. Uh, so the ultimate goal is to provide services that are somehow interoperable uh, between themselves. So we would like uh, to, to, to provide uh, scientific communities with the services that are uh, composable. So the customers can create uh, different pipelines and workflows using them and as you can imagine, this is quite difficult and, and actually the goal of the EOSC interoperability framework layer is to create a flexible fr uh, framework of uh, standards and, and guidelines that uh, somehow facilitate the uh, interoperability and uh, composability uh, of EOSC resources in the EOSC exchange layer via the EOSC core layer. So. From this, you can see that one should invest a significant effort uh, to make service uh, service interoperable, and therefore, within the EOSC architecture, is uh, uh, EOSC architecture um, 
anticipated layer that will uh, support all these activities. And this layer sits uh, along the EOS core and EOS exchange layer, and it uh, uh, comprises the training, uh, engagement, and other, uh, let's call it human-centric uh, activities, which make EOS uh, more attractive and, and uh, easier, easier to use. So now, since we are, uh, uh, let's say, familiar with the architecture of the EOSC, we can say that the onboarding is practically everywhere. So the ultimate goal is to insert service into X exchange layer, but practically it uh, includes integration with the tools from the EOSC core layer and integration uh, with services from the EOSC exchange layer, following some guidelines from uh, the interoperability layer with the support uh, that is provided via the EOSC uh, support support layer. Therefore, in our project, so within the NIFOS Europe, we have defined onboarding as uh, all practical activities to be taken to to incorporate uh, resources outside uh, outside of the EOSC into the EOSC. Uh, into the EOSC uh, Federation, and it has so so it is wide range of of, of support uh, actions that are directly provided to to uh, to resource providers. So, for example, uh, this is establishment of the support channel, so integration of of ex of a resource with the project's uh, help desk. Then it is integration with the existing ELSC services, data verification, integration with the monitoring, accounting system, with the authentication and authorization framework, uh, but also preparation of, of, of uh, uh, preparation of, of uh, user uh, tutorials, uh, access policies, terms of use, etc. Yeah. So uh, we have already presented Agora catalog. So this is the central tool of the NIFOS onboarding procedure and uh, uh, practically all resource provider interact mainly with this uh, tool. So once again, it is illustrated, to, uh, illustrated uh, here and uh, here you can find the link uh, to, 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 to this catalog that is used and practically practical onboarding starts uh, with this catalog. And here I have prepared few main steps. So this is the basic onboard, uh, onboarding workflow. So once you are logged in into the uh, Agora and your uh, credentials are upgraded from the uh, observer status to the admin status. Uh, you can start uh, uh, with the uh... Uh, with the onboarding process. So first thing you should do, you should uh, register yourself as a, as, a, as a provider. So within the Agora, you will be, you will find uh, uh, create button within the uh, resource provider section. And then you will be asked, asked for provider description, but it is not it is not so complicated here is uh, an example so for provider session we expect a brief des description of the uh, provider then acronym geographical location uh, website information legal status of the of the institution uh, domain subdomain some tags should be defined uh, and it will be used uh, just by the uh, search mechanism. Then also we collect uh, uh, contact information and this is really uh, very, very easy. And once it, uh, once it is entered into the system, it will be verified by our onboarding team. And if everything is well, the provider status will be changed from the candidate uh, to the onboarded. Since the Agora is fully integrated in our case, is fully integrated with our monitoring system, some fields, uh, uh, some fields will be automatically checked by monitoring system. For example, uh, for example, URLs, all URLs uh, are at the moment uh, verified by, uh, provided within, uh, within the Agora are verified by our monitoring system. And as I said, if you uh, once you finish, it will be verified by the onboarding team, and uh, you will be 
onboarded as a provider. After that, you can, you can continue with the research onboarding. So you can uh, register the very first re research that will be linked with your uh, organization. Also, some fields are, are expected. So in particular, description of the research, website, readiness level. So uh, in our case, only resources with high readiness uh, level eight or nine uh, will be onboarded uh, to the EOSC marketplace. It means that the, uh, each the, the, that particular resource is already used in the in the production mode. Then we have subdomain, category, subcategory, target users, access type, etc. And what is uh, very important, what we expect during the onboarding uh, process is a user manual. So you have to provide some documentation on how particular resource uh, can be used, then it is terms of use. So the way how resource can be used and privacy policy and access policy. Also, in addition to that uh, training, uh, some training material uh, that, we, that is available and formed in the NIFOS Europe way is expected uh, to be provided. So in this first step of research description, we are call, uh, collecting information uh, about the resource, some descriptions, some policies, user guidelines, and then in the next uh, in the next uh, step, uh, we also also some integration with the EOS core layer or NIFOS Europe pre-production environment is is uh, expected. So we will, uh, as a part of the onboarding procedure, um, our aim is, uh, is 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 to achieve interoperability between EOSC Exchange and EOSC uh, core layer. And uh, here is a set of tools. So that that, uh, that have to be used for this purpose. So in particular, uh, we expect that uh, resource is integrated with our login service. So with authentication authorization layer, then with the uh, GOGDB and Argo system. So these two systems are used uh, for, for, for monitoring. GOGDB just stores the static information about the resources, practical endpoints, type of the resources, and then uh, Argo is monitoring system that performs monitoring of the resource based on this information. Then, as I said, training service and uh, help desk system as well as accounting system. All these tools are also are also uh, geographically distributed uh, within the region, and all of them are registered within the catalog uh, as well. Once this is done, we can say that. Uh, a resource is uh, is could be onboarded, so we can mark it as a onboard and within the regional catalog, and we can publish information to the uh, central EOSC marketplace. Within the NIFOS Europe, we periodically check the information that is uh, entered uh, within the system. This is a semi-automatic procedure, so some information are automatically checked by our monitoring system and some of them are uh, periodically checked by operational uh, operational team. As uh, we mentioned in the previous session, so I think Ander has mentioned open call, so this year we organized open call, so practically in the, during this open call we offered our uh, onboarded resources to user uh, communities and uh, during the for productional use and during the open call we have uh, we have accepted 20 projects uh, and uh, 16 out of these 20 projects require access to high performance computing resources so this is uh, to two generic services and uh, therefore we allocated 3.2 million cpu core hours 120 kilo gpu uh, card hours and 50 terabytes of the storage space and for these purposes in addition 30 terabytes of uh, storage space is allocated for archival purposes and regarding the cloud infrastructure uh, in total 90 virtual machines and uh, 166 virtual uh, machine cores uh, were allocated so it is interesting that all resources uh, uh, required some kind of the generic services. So 16 of them high performance computing. Also, there was five of them that uh, demanded access to, to cloud infrastructure and many of them to, to simple storage service or some uh, some. Uh, 
or other uh, generic services. So therefore, I will quickly uh, present the services that are offered uh, during the open call. So I will start with the high performance uh, computing. So we in the region, we have a large install installation that is uh, known as ARIS. A supercomputer that is provided by GRNet installed in Athens. So the ARIS is a heterogeneous machine. So as you can see, there are more than 400 T nodes. So these are regular compute nodes uh, without additional um, uh, cards, GPU or, or some other. Then there are 44 GPU uh, nodes. Each of these nodes are equipped with two NVIDIA Tesla. Um, K40 cards. Also, they have uh, machines with uh, Xeon Phi, uh, Xeon Phi nodes. Uh, then uh, also, Aris has 44 fat, uh, FAT nodes. So these are machines uh, oriented more to open M approach or something like that so there are a lot of uh, cores so it, these are 40 core machines with uh, uh, 512 gigabytes of of uh, ram and there is uh, one machine learning node that is equipped with uh, eight nvidia volta uh, cards also we have large high performance computing installation in sofia in bulgaria with 150 nodes so in total 2040 uh, cpu cords it is interesting that each node here is equipped with two intel xeon 5 uh, cards and uh, this machine in total provides um, uh, computing capacity of 412 teraflops. Also, large uh, high performance computing in installation is uh, installed in Debrecen. It is Leo high performance computing cluster with uh, 84 uh, computing nodes. And also, this machine is equipped with NVIDIA K20 and K40 uh, cards. Uh, we have also uh, one uh, computing cluster in Zagreb. Uh, provided by uh, our uh, Croatia partner. So the name of the cluster is Isabella. Here in, in Belgrade at the Institute of Physics, we have Paradox installation uh, with 105 teraflops uh, peak performance. Also, uh, Cyprus Institute provides Cyclone cluster with total performance of uh, 600, uh, 600 uh, teraflops. Then regarding the uh, cloud infra infrastructure that are offered during the open call. Our colleagues from uh, University of Kirill and Methodius uh, from Skopje, from Macedonia, uh, they have provided thinking cloud infrastructure with total 300 virtual CPU calls, 37 terabytes of space uh, on SSD and 32, ter and 32 terabytes of SAS storage space. Large cloud in installation we have also at uh, Romania. So EC Pro is in installed in, in Bucharest. And also we have one small uh, cloud cluster in Georgia, in Gruzia, Georgia. So the name of the cluster is gcloud.game. Also during the call, we have provided various type of, of archival services. So Aris provides tape based storage service with total capacity of uh, two uh, petabytes also within the region and with, uh, and what is also registered within the catalog, we have several Hadoop clusters. One of them is, uh, them is known as a data analysis service. Uh, it has 60 CPU cores and uh, six terabytes of the uh, HDFS storage space. And uh, also uh, the popular service during the upper call is a simple storage service. So this is a Dropbox-like tool that, uh, that, that allows uh, sharing of, of, of data, quick sharing, and then synchronization of data between uh, different devices. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dusan. Thank you very much for presenting, uh, for explaining what the generic service is and showing us those examples of how to register a uh, generic service and a provider, a resource provider. Uh, Thank you. Next, we move on to the next speaker. Oops, let me see. Uh, who is um, Bojana Koteska? Uh, to present us the similar, the similar, let's say, uh, workflow about the thematic services. Bujano, the floor is yours. Uh, 
uh, we cannot hear you. Uh, just a second. Can you hear me now? Okay. Yes. I will share the video. Okay. Uh, can you see the screen just okay. to confirm me? Yes. Yes. Thank you. And now I think, yes. So now it's full screen. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. My name is Bojana Kotaska. I'm an, an assistant professor at the Faculty of Computer Science and Engineering in Skopje. And also I'm part of uh, NIFOS project as scientific leader of the computer physics community. And today I'm going to present um, a short presentation about the process of onboarding thematic services. The process of onboarding thematic services is pretty similar to the process of uh, onboarding of the generic services, as uh, Dushan already explained, but I'm going, going to present some differences and also some inf information about the thematic services. Uh, so uh, the NIFOS uh, Europe onboarding procedure is available on the following link. So after the presentation is shared, everyone can uh, check the, the procedure. Uh, so I'm going to present some things about the pre-production environment. Then I will give a, a brief overview of the thematic services and uh, I will present one specific thematic services case study, of course, the process of onboarding. Uh, in our research group, we have developed two, <clears throat> we developed two uh, thematic services which are onboarded on uh, NIFOS catalog. Uh, so I'm going to share the, the process of onboarding of one of them. Uh, as Dushan already explained, in general, the resource onboarding includes five main steps. Uh, for example, uh, they are illustrated on this slide. So uh, first, the the uh, request is sent by the service provider, uh, then uh, relevant information is gathered using a service description template, then the uh, resources are uh, onboarded and validated, and of course there is a uh, the process of integration with the EOSC tools. Uh, so it is in general the, the process of uh, uh, onboarding. Uh, so um, of course uh, the pre-production environment includes um, different tools. So uh, for example, uh, authentication and authorization infrastructure, then GOGDB, greeting configuration database, uh, also, we have uh, the, the help desk, uh, then the, the service for the monitoring, uh, the service for the accounting, and uh, all of these things should be considered when you want to uh, onboard your service. So, for example, uh, you have to provide, of course, help desk, you have to connect your service with the monitoring uh, system, you have to uh, connect your service with the accounting system, you have to provide training in forms of uh, presentations, um, interactive presentations. Also, you have to uh, do presentations in order to introduce the users to your services. So all of these things have, are somehow the uh, part of the process of the onboarding, uh, of process of services onboarding. Um, of course, um, so the pre-production environment uh, is somehow the minimum, all these things that I mentioned, a set of federating services that needs to support the integration. Those things are important because uh, it is the initial set of the original service into the EOSC. So if we want to, uh, let's say, integrate our service uh, into the EOSC, uh, then we need to uh, follow these rules somehow. Um, so this environment in the NIFOS project is uh, equivalent to the EOSC uh, core, and that's why it is um, a very, uh, let's say, useful and um, and uh, explained so everyone can follow and uh, easily can follow easily and onboard uh, their service. Um, so uh, we, we started first uh, with the with the development of course of the service, but we must uh, follow let's say some uh, things that in if we want our service to be onboarded. Uh, so I'm going to talk about this uh, later when I will present my uh, specific use case. Uh, so of course the process also includes verification. So even if you want to onboard your service, you have to um, do all the tasks that are part of the uh, list and then uh, somebody should uh, verify that and approve it is correct. If it's not, you have to probably make some changes. Um, as part of NIFOS Europe, so we have um, 
31 thematic services. Uh, so uh, uh, all those are uh, are uh, uh, can be accessed uh, by the NIFOS catalog. So I'm going to uh, present that shortly. So here is the link catalog NIFOS EU, and uh, here you, if you choose the thematic services, you can see the list of the the services. Um, there are uh, currently 31. Some of them are or onboarded, some of them are um, candidates, and um, some of them are registered. So there are three uh, types of thematic services. Okay, I will continue. So uh, what are, maybe I should explain what are specifically thematic services. Those are research community specific services that provide a real value to the researchers. Uh, so uh, those in our project, those are grouped somehow, but uh, some communities. Uh, for example, we have um, thematic services from computational chemistry, computational physics, uh, etc. Uh, those are proposed by a number of researchers coming from uh, different research institutions across the region, and um, those services usually uh, can be uh, those services can be tools for, for example, some analysis, uh, visualizations, uh, some um, calculations, post processing, and uh, comparison uh, of some. Uh, results. So basically, uh, all the details about the thematic services can be seen on this link that I already provided, and can be uh, the details can be seen there. Uh, these are some thematic services that I already show you. So uh, as part of uh, our research, uh, we developed two thematic services. One of them is Schrodinger API. Uh, Schrodinger API is a RESTful web uh, service uh, which provides a method uh, for solution of one-dimensional, two-dimensional, and three-dimensional time-independent Schrodinger equation. Uh, so um, it is, uh, it, as I said, it is a RESTful API, which means that it can be easily accessed. Uh, so I'm going to show you what is the first step that we need to do in order to develop this service. So uh, after we, of course, we uh, we finish with the development process, we have this uh, here. Um, let's say uh, we have to provide user manual, of course, for the for all the uh, users. Then we uh, we have to define these terms of use, for example. This was uh, mandatory in order to onboard our service. Uh, then we have to uh, develop privacy policy uh, and, of course, at the end, acceptable use policy in order to onboard this research. So this uh, service can be accessed, of course, online. Uh, the link is Schrodinger, Chemapet, Finki, Pukimaka. Um, but um, this was the first step. So after we finish with uh, the, the development of, of course, of the methods and the, uh, the these documents, for example, user manual is uh, also uh, is, is also a requirement for uh, the the onboarding process. Uh, then we continue with some other things. Uh, so uh, the first thing, uh, in order to uh, uh, this service to be put in the catalog of the NIFOS EU, uh, as you can see, uh, it's it's already published, onboarded. But here you uh, uh, have to provide these links, as I already show you: user manual, terms of use, privacy policy, access policy, and this is the training course uh, provided by the Moodle platform uh, and help desk, which is uh, a link. Uh, a form will be opened with a link, of course, of the uh, of contact form. So I can show you also that. So here, if you want to, let's say, if you want to find the service, here it is. So more. You should see that uh, we have user manual link, also terms of service, privacy policy, access policy. This is the training link which is linked to the Moodle platform training at NIFOS EU. And, um, I'm sorry. And of course we have help desk, which is, uh, 
form for sending requests which will uh, be sent to the uh, contact person email and uh, what else uh, we have this monitoring status which is currently okay so in order to have this monitoring status we have to make some um, add some code and also in uh, I will show you about the accounting system so because we want to uh, pr provide uh, some details about uh, how many for example how many users access the 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 rest API, this uh, the service how many uh, how many time etc how much time sorry and that's why we have to uh, integrate it with the accounting system okay um so uh the activities uh in summary include service description uh this is the part of service description then uh, user manual terms of use privacy policy help desk then we have to provide uh, in our case we don't have a specific uh, authentication for the service because it's open but if you have you have to do that of course and then uh, training resources accounting and of course the first thing you, we need to consider in order to uh, our service to be onboarded is to uh, check the uh, TRL uh, level technology readiness level uh, so the onboarding starts with technology readiness level uh, greater than seven and uh, then it can be of course upgraded later so the, the first thing we do after the uh, these documents was the uh, the registering service in Agora, as Dushan already explained. So we provide some basic information, marketing information, etc. Uh, then we uh, defined uh, the target group users, access type, access mode, and all all these things that are same for all services. Uh, the domain, the subdomain of the service, etc. So these are useful information in order to uh, the the service to be easily searched later. Uh, for the help desk, I already show you. Uh, we have to provide contact person uh, in order this uh, all the requests and questions uh, can be sent by email. So this form sends an email to the contact person. Uh, then uh, we have uh, this um, GogDB uh so uh here we uh here we uh, provide this gogdb contains general information about the sites uh participating to the production of the grid so here we also have to add some uh things in for the for our uh service the process of monitoring uh, is provided with uh argo so argo if I say you EU is the uh, site so you can see the uh, the the status the monitoring status of our service so here I uh, chose for example uh, specifically uh, this service and I can see that uh, the status reliability and availability is uh, almost 100 uh, percent so we have some problems maybe here and later everything is okay but what you have to do as a user uh, basically uh, you have to uh, provide some information at uh, and to this uh, service Argo and also um, you have to add some code in order to um, to integrate your service so uh, the last thing we did was the accounting part uh, so we added uh, this is uh, of course accounting uh, service this one is a uh, uh, of course uh, same rest api so in order to use uh, you have to uh, call some functions from your code and to push some data uh, which will be shown automatically here so if i choose this part web science uh, which is for this uh, for these thematic services so i can see the uh, the use using of the specific services that are provided here so for example from our for, for specifically for our service schrodinger api we can see that um uh, there are 17 uh accesses to our service in september uh so far so uh more details of course can be provided and seen uh, as a conclusion, so um, NIFAS Europe uh, contributes to the EOSC, European uh, Open Scientific Cloud, 
um, by this uh, provi by providing these uh, services, specifically thematic services, and um, uh, also these services are implemented in the Agora catalog, as uh, my colleagues mentioned. Then uh, some of them are already provided in the EOS portal uh, catalog marketplace, and of course they can be access of the NIFOS uh, Europe digital catalog. So that's everything from me. Uh, thank you. If you have any questions, please, please let me know. Thank you, Bojana. Thank you very much uh, so for online, this overview uh, and in the providing a, an example of how you onboarded your thematic service. That was very helpful to, to see. Uh, we have a Q&A well, session at the end, so uh, if you have any questions, okay. please add them on the, mm -hmm. in the chat. Um, okay. so next, we have uh, two speakers for the last presentation. Uh, it will be about repositories, mm -hmm. onboarding repositories uh, in the NIFOS catalog linked to the ESP marketplace, starting with Milica from the University of Belgrade, who will be introducing us to this concept. Hello, Thanks. everyone. You sh should be seeing my screen at the moment, I believe. So let me introduce myself. Uh, I work as a librarian in the, at the Institute of Technical Sciences of the Serbian Academy of Sciences and Arts, but I'm also a part of the repository development team at the University of Belgrade Computer Center. And I've been involved in the NIFOS Europe uh, project uh, practically in almost all work packages. Uh, and I was most of the time I was responsible for onboarding repositories uh, in the NIFOS Europe uh, regional catalog. So. Uh, I won't uh, repeat all the stuff that is uh, similar or the same uh, to, to the other services. Repositories are a bit, a bit specific service. Uh, there, you, usually, most of the time, you don't have the problem with access because they are meant to be open access. Uh, they are meant to be available to everyone. So you don't really need, you can access many things in repositories even without having to log in. But what differs repositories from other services is that they have uh, actually two facets that are important for the user. One is that they are a service. Each repository is a service. So uh, they can see, uh, they can be seen as a package of some functionalities, policies, etc. On the other hand, the repositories have uh, content. So they have some research products uh, that are uh, available in them and that are, that are actually uh, of main interest for users. Users are interested in repositories because of, the, uh, of, the, of their content. In the case of an institutional repository, uh, users who deposit, who can deposit, are limited to an institution. And the body of users using the research product is actually uh, much greater than, than those users that can deposit in a repository, that can use repository as a service. So we had to take into account these two perspectives uh, when speaking about onboarding of repositories. And this was at the beginning of the project, this was a bit confusing to us because it was not clear uh, what is actually to be onboarded. And it was after some discussion that we realized that we will actually have to take uh, two main paths. One is onboarding repository as a service, and the other is onboarding uh, research products from the repository to, to the EOSC uh, catalog and marketplace. At the moment, you can see in the EOSC marketplace uh, only repositories as services, and it is expected uh, uh, the pro portal will be upgraded, and early November you will be able to search research products uh, from repositories, uh, and this is actually what what brings uh, to the uh, actually contributes to this confusion because at the moment you can't see these research products and it's not always clear. So in order to onboard a repository as a service, you can go either directly uh, directly to the EOS catalog, uh, register there as a provider and follow the, the procedures, fill out all the forms, provide all the necessary information, meet the required uh, technological readiness level, and you will be onboarded. The other path, and it is explained why we use this part, is onboarding to a regional service catalog. Nifus Europe is not the, the only regional uh, service catalog, but it's probably 
uh, I dare say, the most integrated with the EOS catalog and marketplace in terms of communication, in terms of uh, the alignment of, of the standards used. The path used for onboarding uh, reposit uh, re research products from repositories goes through open air. And the open air uh, research graph is plays a crucial role in this. Repositories need to be integrated with open air. This means that they have to meet certain uh, certain requirements, and they have to be in line with certain standards. And you will he hear more about this in the second presentation that will actually uh, focus on on research products and at, on this kind of interoperability uh, at the level at the level of communication between one repository and at an, ag an aggregator and the integration of this content into the open air research graph. So this is the crucial difference between repositories and all the other services that have been covered uh, in today's uh, presentation. So I will talk about onboarding a repository as a service. Uh, there are generally these two parts that I mentioned and uh, before taking these two taking steps towards onboarding, you will have to make an analysis to see what is missing, what the requirements are and what is missing in your repository, whether you have all the policies, whether you have uh, the adequate metadata to describe the repository itself as a service, uh, whether you know your audience, research areas, etc. So uh, if you don't have these policies, you have to draft them. And also you have to prepare training materials and manuals. This is what Boyan explained about uh, uh, thematic services. This is absolutely the same uh, procedure that is applied uh, for repositories. So this is how an onboarded repository looks like. This is in the European Science Open Cloud, uh, Open Science Cloud. Uh, this is uh, a repository that was actually uh, originally onboarded on the NIFOS Europe uh, uh, service catalog. And you can see that all these pieces of information that are available in our regional catalog are also available here. Uh, this is a basic description. And you can also find additional information about contacts, uh, contact, uh, contacts about the technological readiness level. This is eight. Uh, there are the repositories in our service catalog that are actually nine, which means that they are fully, uh, fully functional, fully, fully operational. And there is also a link to the resource, and you can access this resource uh, through the, the uh, EOS portal, through the EOS catalog and marketplace. So uh, this is for this is these are the instructions for direct onboarding. If you're going through uh, directly to the EOS portal, you can find abundant documentation about this, and this documentation will be updated uh, because the procedure will be slightly slightly updated uh, with the new release early in November. Also, you can uh, use the the manual path. You can onboard by filling out the uh, the form. On the EOSC portal, but you can also use an, an API that is available if you, for example, have multiple services or multiple repositories that you wish to onboard. Uh, similar procedure applies to the regional catalog. And uh, in our uh, specific case, we actually had to make a selection and a plan at the very beginning. Uh, during the project drafting procedure, some, some resources were uh, identified, but some of them, we actually had to give up the idea of onboarding some of them because it was difficult to integrate them with uh, the open air, they missed policies, etc. So this, this changed a bit. Uh, then we had to prepare metadata to describe repositories and this exercise was initially done in a in a spreadsheet to identify all the necessary fields, uh, all the necessary pieces of information that would actually be required for onboarding. We had to make some contacts with repository providers to suggest to them uh, that they need to do something to, to provide some data that is missing. And also uh, particularly challenging was the process of drafting policies. And in the context of this project, we've developed a tool that can be used uh, by, by anyone globally, uh, but actually it was uh, tested uh, in our project to draft uh, repository policies. And also the process of drafting uh, training materials was guided uh, within Rock Package 6. 
we were offered uh, templates that we we could actually that guided us through the project and also uh, these uh, training materials are very nice because they are uh, at eventually presented as SCORM packages uh, on the Moodle platform. So everything was done actually in, in line with the best practice. And then after that, you just uh, take steps towards onboarding this to Agora. You just uh, log in to the platform and then fill out all the forms. But this actually, this piece that precedes uh, the onboarding itself is actually very, very important, uh, this preparatory work. So uh, uh, you can find more information uh, on these links about uh, the REPL tool. Uh, what, what the best, uh, uh, what is actually the most important about this tool is it, it, it has a module structure and it can be extended and adjusted to different pur purposes. Already uh, during the project, uh, we uh, adjusted the form that uh, how it works. Uh, you have a form you fill out a very simple form and then you get as, as an output you get uh, a text a meaningful text uh, of the of a repository policy during the project we added another form that uh, actually can help you produce uh, privacy policies and uh, you can actually the code is open so you can uh, adjust it to uh, create any other structure type of policy uh, some even some ter terms of use that are not, not too specific or some uh, checklists or some other kinds of policies that are that are highly structured. Uh, this is how our training materials look like. I won't describe this, Boyana has already mentioned. And uh, also this is the form uh, you have already seen during previous presentation, how it looks like and the types of information inserted there. Also, these links, the same links apply to uh, to repositories. And for us, this monitoring is particularly interesting. This is the help desk form. So this is the monitoring where we can see, for example, that some of our services uh, have some critical issues or so have some warnings. And this is very useful information for our users. For example, in case of repositories, we have some issues in Serbia with uh, security certificates. And uh, this tool indicates when some of these policies are about to uh, certificates are about to expire so the benefits that we had from this process uh, this part of the process onboarding uh, repositories of services is actually that we have achieved the compliance with the portal, portal requirements in a very in a safe and guided way within the project uh, that we've managed to integrate better with European infrastructures our repositories are now uh, have a better visibility in the region and also, uh, we have a better insight into the availability and quality of infrastructure, which is very useful when discussing these issues with policymakers or even with users. Uh, we are in line oh, with the. Sorry, Milica, to interrupt. We have 10 minutes left, and I think there is one other speaker, if I'm correct. Okay, okay we can, can end. The next speaker to finish within five minutes to at least give the opportunity for one question. Okay. Thanks. Okay, it's I'm very that way. Okay. Okay, uh, thanks Milica. Uh, Antonis, uh, Antonis has a, a skill to talk fast, so that's good. <laughs> and mm -hmm. he can uh, deliver uh, in, in short time. Mm -hmm. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, let me try to share my screen. Uh, I don't know what you can see. Uh, yes, if you're doing normal, you must yes, perfect. perfect. Okay, I'm here to talk about Provide. Uh, it's a, a rather lengthy presentation, but I will cut it short. Uh, it's my specialty. Anyway, uh, this is the Open Air Provide. Uh, this is the Content Provider Dashboard. This is the dashboard that we have uh, created in Open Air for uh, content providers, repository owners, journal, not owners, managers, uh, journal managers, aggregators, anyone with uh, content that, wants, uh, that would like to share it to Open Air and then to the rest of uh, of uh, the world. Uh, this is the first page. I'm going fast. This is what you see after you have registered your repository and it's been harvested. It offers all the services that Open Air services uh, Open Air provides to uh, its users, to the repository managers. Uh, 
Uh, the first um, key point, and I think it's the most important in this discussion, is about the validator and the interoperability. Uh, the main, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this is running too fast. Uh, the first uh, point is when trying to uh, to join open air is that your metadata, the, your content must be interoperable with the rest of the world. Uh, open air has devised a number of guidelines depending on the number or the kind of uh, uh, of content, uh, literature, uh, publications, or data, or software, uh, and uh, your goal is to try to follow those guidelines if you want to join OpenAir. And OpenAir is also, uh, I'm sorry for a second, uh, I'm sorry for this, and uh, OpenAir is also providing a validation service uh, that allows you to make sure that your content is uh, following the OpenAir guidelines. Uh, we have we have guidelines uh, for publications, uh, for research data, uh, for research software, and other research outputs. And the latest addition is about the research information, the CRI systems, and you can find details about them in guidelines.openair.eu. Uh, so why use the open air guidelines? Uh, first of all, it's a way to have interoperability between the metadata of different providers. Uh, we try to support fair principles. And we have different guidelines depending on the different kinds of research results, publications, uh, research data, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We try to reuse existing templates, so it's Dublin Core for publications, data site for data, and software, I think, and the other research products. They also they also follow the data site uh, template, and we also try to reuse and uh, enrich existing dictionaries and ontologies. For example, the types of PIDs we follow. Uh, an established uh, ontology for this. We don't devise our own. Uh, so uh, the first tool that is provided to you in, uh, in, in, uh, in the provide portal, you don't have to register your repository to use it. You just have to register as a user. Uh, is the validator. Uh, you begin by. Uh, I don't know if you can see my mouse pointer. You can. You begin by uh, selecting uh, the OEI PMH uh, URL mm -hmm. of your repository uh, here or here if you have already registered. Uh, then you select the guidelines you want to apply. In our case, we selected the literature repository, so we are presented with uh, the four versions of uh, uh, the literature guidelines, uh, the basic one or the driver ones, version two, version three, and the version four, which is coming or has recently been uh, enabled. Uh, you can select or deselect specific rules you want to apply in your content or in your metadata. Uh, a few other parameters, how many records to uh, to validate, all of them or a subset, if you want to have a quick validation. Which validation set, uh, which OAI PMH set uh, to validate. And this is something obsolete, which will be uh, removed in the future. And you press submit and then you wait. If you go to the validation history page, you'll see all the validations you have submitted in the past. Uh, and uh, you can view the results of one of them. And this is a result page. I'm not sure you can see everything. Uh, for every rule, uh, you have the score, uh, the average score. Uh, you can see the the rules, uh, the list of rules, specific rules, uh, how many of them passed uh, the test, how many of them failed in this case. Uh, if the rules are mandatory, then it's an error. If the rules are uh, recommended, then it's a just a warning. Uh, you can see various other information, how long it took to run, uh, etc. etc. Uh, and after uh, several rounds, I guess, of uh, validation, you go back to, to your content, you uh, fix something, you go back and validate again, 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 and again. It's time to uh, to register the repository in open air and uh, share your data uh, with everyone. Uh, how much time do I have? Is it five minutes? Yeah, well, okay. it's less, but yes, yeah, okay. A few things about the registration, and I will skip the rest. Uh, first of all, about uh, the registration, uh, we try to use established registries, and by that I mean that OpenAir does not want to have to to become a registry of repositories. So we uh, enforce uh, enforce we uh, yes we enforce the use of existing registries uh, like OpenDoor for literature repositories, uh, Retrieve Data for data, and Dries for the CRI systems. 
Uh, so if your repository is one of these kinds, then you, first you have to go to this registry, register there, OpenAI will pick up this uh, new repository, and you will be able to, to, to register. I'll show you in a few screenshots. Uh, currently, we support OEIP MH and resourcing protocols. Uh, after you register, uh, sorry, you register your uh, repository to OpenAI, there is an automatic validation. And uh, an offline round of uh, of discussion between the repository manager and the open air team uh, starts where we set up uh, custom uh, rules for cleanup and transformation for the repository. And after a while, the repository is ready to be uh, to be harvested. Uh, so uh, let me show you. you have uh, first of all, you selected that you want to uh, to register a literature repository. Uh, this is the sign, the a warning saying that. If you cannot find your repository in the list, register an open door and uh, come back a couple of days later. Uh, you select the country, and then from the list below, you select the repository you want to uh, to register. Uh, after you select it, you are presented with the information about uh, the repository. This comes from open door again. Uh, you are able to change uh, anything. Uh, then you set up uh, your OEIPMH details, uh, the URL, uh, the set that you want to uh, want us to harvest from uh, what kind of uh, this? Is the, this is the desired compatibility level. Actually, you select the guidelines that you uh, would like to uh, to be compliant with. So it's uh, guidelines version two, three, four, uh, and that's it. You finish. Uh, Open air will start harvesting, and uh, then you can see the aggregation history uh, in this page. You can see when uh, when Open air is harvesting the repository, how many records were harvested. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. Uh, I think that's it. So I will stop here. We don't have much time. Okay. Uh, Sorry, Nilita uh, and Anthony. We we are you through this. Sorry. No, no worries. I'm, I like to be. Uh, I like to be running. Um, we are at the end of our webinar, unfortunately, and I'm afraid we will not be able to do the Q and A session anymore. So um, because it's 12.30, that's what it was scheduled. Um, however, um, I would like to give the audience the opportunity of, of pose one important question. If